Good afternoon. I'm here to present our work on in the wild image synthesis and manipulation. This is a joint work with my advisors, Deva Ramanan and Yasser Sheikh at CMU. The goal of this work is to enable anyone, even a six year old, to create images on simple compute devices. Creating images is hard, but dragging and dropping shapes with a semantic label is both easy and intuitive. In this work, our goal is to create images from these label maps. Recent work in this direction have primarily used neural networks. These works have shown remarkable performance for a constrained data distribution such as cityscapes, where one can expect certain labels at a particular location. However, once trained for a fixed set of classes, these approaches cannot be used for diverse categories or examples not available at training time. Generating rarely seen examples using these model-based approaches is not trivial. In this work, our goal is to overcome these problems with an interpretable, flexible, and efficient approach that can run on lightweight mobile devices. We look towards a decade-old non-parametric approach to address these issues. While this approach was limited by the data of its time and pixel-wise compute demands, we are very fortunate to have comprehensively labeled data sets such as COCO that consists of various semantic and instance label maps. Importantly, it is varied and does not have a fixed structure. Given an input label map, our goal is to generate multiple plausible images. In this work, we make use of hierarchical matching for efficient retrieval of images, shapes, and parts. We use an indicator vector that tells what categories are present. This indicator vector helps us to quickly find the relevant matches in the training set, thereby reducing the search space for shapes drastically. We now have to look in less than 1% of the data set to get the required shapes. We extract different shapes from our input and find relevant matches by simple correlation of shapes in the shortlisted set of exemplar image matches. As an example, we can get different sky component, ground, person, person two, person three, kite, etc. A simple assembly of these components give us a new image. Importantly, multiple outputs can be easily generated by mixing and matching these components. The simple shape-based matching will, however, fail if we do not find an exact match. Showing an example where we could not find the exact match. We studied this problem closely. Given an input shape on left, the match global shape is on right. We see that relevant information is available. However, strict matching does not allow to capture it. We need to relax strict shape matching and enable local warping. To do so, we match local parts, which are 16 crossed in 16 regions, with context shown in green. For each part, we search for an optimal correlation-based match within a larger region in the exemplar image, shown in yellow. We'll come up. The simple local matching enables us to generate complete outputs now, showing some outputs from our approach, input and output, using our approach in cluttered scenarios. We compare our approach with picks to picks and other recent methods. We found picks to picks to work best and easy to use for all purposes, showing more comparisons. We use different evaluation criteria, such as pre-trained mass carcin and model to study segmentation on generated images, FID score, and human studies. The proposed approach works better on all measures. Importantly, our approach can get multiple outputs very easily. More results showing different configuration of baseball player and zebras in different possible environments. Here we point to the applicability of our approach for diverse settings, varying foreground and background, with all sorts of deformable and non-deformable objects, such as humans, elephants, bears, zebra, giraffe, birds, children, dogs, swan, and even cluttered settings like stadiums. In summary, we describe an approach to conditional image generation inspired by classic non-parametric approach. While simple, our approach is interpretable, interactive, and controllable generalizes to new examples, and can be used to generate images with arbitrary resolution. Allow me to conclude with an important note. While we are on our way to create new approaches for image creation, let us not forget the simple nearest neighbors. At the very least, we need to have them in conversation. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Guo Junyin from University of Science and Technology of China. My presentation title is Semantic Distangling for Text to Image Generation. Text to Image Generation aims at using natural language text to generate a photorealistic image. It's a more natural but challenging way to generate an image based on the text due to the cosmodality generation. General methods for text to image generation usually adopt the stack gun for high resolution. However, the natural language descriptions are usually su subjective. For example, there are two different forms of text to describe this image. Previous method stack gun generates the images by two stages from low resolution to high resolution. But the generated images look unlike as the example shown here. Another method attention gun performs better for the detail generation, but these generated images still look alike. It shows the rich variation of language expressions pose challenges in distilling consistent semantic comments from the distant descriptions of the same image. To overcome this problem, we propose a novel semantic distangling generative adversarial network. Each branch of the same structure is a hierarchical gun for the test to image generation. During the training period, these two branches are optimized together by the constructive laws. The generators use the proposed semantic condition batch normalization for more visual semantic embedding. The constructive laws is used to minimize the distance between the generated images from the descriptions of the same image and maximize the distance of those generated images from the descriptions of different images. We introduced a hyperparameter alpha to avoid the fake images generated too closely, even though they input two Im descriptions are from the same image with the same semantics. The generators of our SD gun follow the stack mechanism and contains the proposed semantic condition batch normalization. The purpose of SCBN is to reinforce the visual semantic embedding in the facial maps of generative networks. It enables linguistic embedding to manipulate the facial maps by the modulation parameters based on the semantic conditions. The semantic conditions can be based on the sentence level feature and the word level feature. Given a sentence level feature vector, we use the MLP to calculate the modulation parameters. While given a set of word feature vectors, we use VSE to calculate these modulation parameters. To evaluate the effectiveness of semi structure and SCBN, the baseline just stretches the primitive shape of objects lacking the exact descriptions. If you use SCBN, more details are generated. If you use semi structure, the generated images look more similar. If you use both SCBN and semi structure, the generated images retain both semantic comments and details. The quantitative results also show the exact performance of the proposed SCBN and semi structure. The quantitative results of SDGAN comparing with the other methods are listed here. The proposed SCBN and semi structure also show uh, the transformable ability by combining with the attention gun. And we also take the human evaluation. And about 70% users choose the generated images by SD gun as the best results. Our semantic distangling generative adversarial network retain both semantic comments with the semi structure and retain the semantic de details with the proposed semantic conditional batch normalization. The poster will be held at number 119. Our another work about dense captioning will be introduced as a poster tomorrow. Thank you for your attention.
will present synthesizing realistic images from semantic layouts using Spade. Let me start with our interactive app called Guggen. It has semantic palette. Let's pick a label and use the fill mode to replace cloud with ocean. Some cliff rock will be nice. Let me make the scene more interesting by adding a small rock and a faraway mountain in the back. You can apply different styles to the image by randomly generating the style code or by stealing the style code from reference images. We continue drawing by adding a small beach. You can try different styles or different semantics. Each can be controlled separately. This time, let's draw some mountains and trees. I first draw grass-covered hill in the foreground and mountain in the back. More cloud will be nice. How about we plant a tree on the hill, like this? Note that the same tree label renders into two visually distinct objects, the trunk and the leaves of the tree. Now let's change the season. Even though we only replaced the label of the foreground from grass to snow, our image generator did more than that. The tree leaves are gone, and now there's snow in the back mountain. If you go back to grass, the tree leaves are back, and the snow in the back mountain disappears. Now I'm going to draw a small pond. Look how the image generator creates reflection of the tree in the water. There is an online interactive demo you can play with, so feel free to make your own creation and discover your artistic inner self. So how can we generate photorealistic images from semantic layouts? Previous works tackle this problem on simple domains like the cityscapes dataset, but they do not generalize to more diverse labels. In contrast, our method produces nice images. So here's our motivation. A standard deep network consists of convolution followed by normalization. We know normalization yields nice properties such as smoother gradient or invariance to input scaling, but we realized applying it on semantic map results in too much invariance, sometimes even losing the input semantic information. For example, suppose the input label map was 100% grass. Convolution will produce uniform activations, which will all become zero once we normalize them. And this was indeed true for Pixupix HD. If the label was uniform, the output was always flat gray, no matter which label we used. Therefore, to preserve semantic information, after every normalization, we propose to input the semantic map. And indeed, our method produces plausible texture for each class label, confirming that the semantic signal is not lost. How do we implement this? We extend the idea of conditional batch norm, which has been popular in class conditional image generation and super resolution task. For our task, we make the affine transformation spatially adaptive, conditioned on the input semantic layout. In more detail, we pass the semantic map through convolutional layers to produce feature tensors. Then after normalization, we do element-wise operation using the feature tensors. Now our generator architecture can start from random noise and use the semantic map at every spade layer of upsampling ResNet blocks. Moreover, the new architecture allows nice separation between semantic and style control. Changing the layout results in manipulating the content, while changing the random vector results in different styles. You can even jointly train an image encoder that captures the style of reference images. These images were all generated from semantic layouts, trained on Flickr images. Please visit our website for code, online interactive demo, and pre-trained models. Thank you.
Okay, now we have a question and answer session for the next three minutes. There's two microphones in this room, one over there, one over there. Please step up and ask any questions that you have. Uh, I have a question for the disentangling uh, paper. Um, you proposed the contrastive loss for disentangling semantic description, but can this be extended to a more broader context to avoid moid collapse in general in GANs? Okay, that's a good question. And uh, we use the contrastive loss to avoid the fake image to make the uh, mode claps, but we minimize the distance between the uh, generated image from the same semantics, but we maximize the distance of the generated image from the different inscriptions from the different images. And we also uh, insert the alpha to avoid to the, uh, even the uh, descriptions are from the same image, the generated images are not supposed to be too closely. And we should uh, set an alpha to make a difference between the generated images. So. Thank you. I have a question for the second presenter. Mm, your model is kind of complex, so I want to know how long does it take to train your model and uh, what's your batch size in your training? Thank you. Uh, okay, in the training, we use uh, 64 G, uh, Titan, uh, Titan XP to train the model, and uh, we use the 256 pairs in, the, in a batch size, in a batch. Okay. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Mm, okay, I'll ask a quick question. So for the shapes and context work, you ended with a, a stirring defense of nearest neighbor. Could you maybe elaborate on I don't know, what you think that you're capturing that a neural network isn't or couldn't? Or what's your advantage of manipulating the data in the way you do? So, uh, as, as I mentioned in the slide as well, one of the important advantages, like if you are thinking from a user-based application over here, and let's say, let's forget about the things, how we train or other things. So let's say you have create an app and you want to deploy it to a million users, and afterwards a user want to say, I want to have this new example or category, right? One way is you will go back and say to the company which created that app, okay, create a new model for me with this N plus one category. Or you can say, just download 10 images from the internet and have that label and add it in your data set. Okay, so sorry. that's done. Sorry, it's easy to index new data. Yeah, okay. Uh, can the next speaker, yes, come on up. And thank you, Steve, for restarting that. And, th and th thank you again for the previous set of three speakers. Hi, um, I'm Zhen Zhu from Huazhong University of Science and Technology. I'm presenting you our paper, Progressive Post-Attention Transfer for Person Image Generation. In this paper, we are solving the post-transfer problem. So what's post-transfer? Given a person image like this and some target poses, we wish to generate this person's images under these target poses. The challenge of this task is to generate images of huge scale variance, large deformation, and viewpoint changes. This may be difficult for many successful image-to-image -image translation methods. Our method is quite intuitive. If it's hard to do it at once, we do it step by step and progressively achieve our goal. In the input side, we first use some convolutions to encode condition image and the poses to corresponding appearance code and postcode. Then we use uh, the core post-attentional transfer network to progressively transfer the appearance features to places indicated by the pose in the feature level. The final appearance code will thus be decoded to your images that are later challenged by discriminators. Uh, let's look into the design of the individual post-attentional transfer block. Post pathway senses the current construction and then decides where to attend and transfer in the legs to move while appearance pathway conducts this decision. Current transfer is accumulated with previous transfers through an add operation. 
To figure out what's going on inside the PATN, we visualize the attention map inside every single PATB. The initial three masks are some sort of blending of condition pose and target pose. As the condition pose is transferred towards the target pose, the regions need to be adjusted, are shrank and scattered. Eventually, the last two mask columns show that the attention is turned from foreground to background for refinement. We performed experiments on two data sets. One is deep fashion, and, and the other is market. Some visual results are shown in this slide. It can be seen that our generated images of each data set are basically the best among the competitors. For ablation studies, we first compare our PATN with a standard resonite generator and a different number of blocks. This could verify the effectiveness of our progressive manner and the superiority of our PATB. You could see that our generator is good at exact, extract some tiny but representative appearance information, which usually occupies a small portion of the image, such as the white hat and the right T-shirt, while resonate generators fails in these cases. Besides better performance, our model is faster and has smaller amount of parameters compared to other methods. An important application of this task is person re-identification. Person re id search images containing the same person from a large image gallery. However, it's hard to collect and label data, so it would be nice if we could just generate a lot of data. We prove it in our paper that when data amount is not sufficient, our generated images could be quite helpful. Using our data to train the model could achieve the theoretical performance upper bound. Using insufficient data to train gives us the performance lower bound. When using generated images as the complementary data, the performance gain with regards to the lower bound is mainly achieved by the generated images. We can c conduct experiments on two different backbones. The performance curves show that our generated data could be of great use when data is insufficient. The less the amount of real data, the higher the performance improvement. We made a video in using our method plus deformable skip connection the first row represents the condition images that gives the appearance reference. The first column gives the post sequences. The rest are our generated images. Thank you. If you are interested in our paper, please visit our poster at 121. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Sujie Song from Peking University. I'm glad to present our work, Unsupervised Person Image Generation with Semantic Parsing Transformation. It's a joint work with Peking University and JDI Research. Our model can not only achieve post guided image generation, it's also generalizable to other tasks, including clothing texture transfer and controlled image manipulation. In our work, we start from post guided image generation. It's the same task with the previous tag, which is really a great tag. Uh, but we tackle the problem in the unsupervised setting that we don't have to get ground truth images and the targeted pose. Uh, an image can be our training data. It's very flexible, but there are also many challenges in learning the mapping function. First of all, the non-rigid nature of human body makes it difficult to transform the spatially misaligned body parts. Second, clothing attributes like sleeve lengths and textures are generally difficult to preserve during generation. However, these clothing attributes are really important for human visual perception. Third, the lack of period training data gives little clue in establishing effective objective functions. In our work, we introduce semantic parsing as the bridge to learn the hard mapping of input and output image. More specifically, we decompose post-guided image generation into semantic parsing transformation and appearance generation. In semantic parsing transformation, we aim to transform the semantic map of the condition image to the target pose. The semantic map provides information of shape and contour, and with the guidance, we generate people's appearance with the appearance generator. 
Since we don't have ground truth images and a target pose, we use cycle consistency to train our network. We also find that end-to-end -end training our network is able to refine its matching maps and the uh, better results. Next, I will present our training in detail. We first train the semantic parsing transformation. Since semantic maps don't associate with closing, uh, closing textures, people in different closing may share similar semantic maps. Thus, we define a simple but effective metric to search semantic maps as pseudo-labeled to pre-train the semantic generation. Thus, the semantic generator is trained using cross-entropy loss with a pseudo-label and an adversarial loss to help generate semantic maps that are visually similar to the realistic ones. For appearance generation, which generates color images according to the semantic map, a discriminator is first used to help generate realistic images. And we use post loss with a post detector to generate images faithful to the target pose. A semantic aware style loss is proposed to ensure style consistency between corresponding semantic regions. And we use another discriminator to generate natural faces. Semantic parsing transformation and appearance generation can be trained in two stages, but searching error and parsing error in the pseudo label generation would lead to instabilities in training. So we tackle such issue by end-to-end -end training. Then the semantic maps serve as latent variables and they can be jointly optimized. Now we show our experiments. We first evaluate the importance of semantic transformation. Without the guidance of semantic maps, the network is difficult to handle the shape and appearance at the same time. If we first transform the semantic parsing and train in two stage, we get better results. But the arrows in the predicted semantic maps lead to long hair of the man and the weird sleeve. With end-to-end -end training, such errors can be eliminated in the refined semantic maps, and the haircut and the surveillance are well preserved. We compare our post-guide image generation results with other methods. We generate more pl visual pleasant results and successfully preserve the closing attributes. Here's another example. The textures are well rendered. Now, let's see our application of our model. It can be utilized on closing texture transfer. Here we show the bidirectional transfer results. Here's another application, controlled image manipulation. By modifying the semantic maps, we can change the sleeve length of the girl or change skirt to pants. In this paper, to tackle unsupervised person image generation, we decompose a task into semantic parsing transformation and appearance generation. Our model is end-to-end -end trainable for better results. We also show our model can be applied on closing texture transfer and controlled image manipulation. Welcome to our poster so we can have more discussion. Thank you. Hi. I'm John Flynn, and I'm presenting Deep View View Synthesis with Learn Gradient Descent. We present a new technique for photorealistic view synthesis. Given a sparse set of input views, our method uses Learn Gradient Descent to generate a multiplane image. A multiplane image, or MPI, is a representation of a scene that allows real time re rendering to new viewpoints with standard graphics hardware. MPIs are a powerful representation that can model complex appearance effects, including transparency reflections and even the volumetric effect seen here. An MPI consists of a, a set of planes, each with an associated RGBA texture map. The planes are positioned at equally spaced inverse depths with respect to a virtual reference camera. To render an MPI to a new viewpoint, we simply warp the MPI images and then composite them using standard alpha blending. But how do we create a set of an MPI from a set of input images? Well, one approach is to use a standard feed forward deep network to predict the MPI. In these methods, the images are typically input as plane sweep volumes, allowing the network to more efficiently combine input images at different poses. Such approaches rely on network layers to model the visibility between the input views and the predicted MPI, which can be expensive. For example, in this toy scene, the green square and yellow triangle in the front occlude the pink shape at the back in some of the input views. 
In order for a network to correctly reconstruct the pink shape, the front and back MPI layers would need to communicate, implying a very large receptive field and hence expensive network. Another possible approach to generate an MPI is to model it as an inverse problem and iteratively optimize its parameters with standard gradient descent. The gradients here are computed from the difference between the input images and the images rendered from the MPI. By starting from an initial MPI and iteratively improving it, such an approach intrinsically models visibility between the MPI and the input images. However, this approach is very slow, requiring many iterations before convergence. And given a limited set of input views, simple optimization will lead to overfitting as seen here. Our method instead uses the recently introduced learned gradient descent. This technique combines the best features of the two ideas I just mentioned, deep learning and direct optimization. Now, traditional deep learning relies on optimization typically only during training to find the network weights. However, learned gradient descent models inverse problems such as MPI generation as unrolled optimizations at inference time. This is achieved by replacing the simple gradient descent update rule with a CNN. The idea is that a CNN can learn to take larger steps than the standard gradient descent update rule, as well as reduce overfitting by constraining the generated model, in our case, the MPI, to lie on the manifold of plausible scenes. We can stack these gradient computation and update blocks repeatedly, creating a form of recurrent network. We can then train the complete unrolled network by rendering the generated MPI to a held out view. For a particular problem, we can also replace the initial update block with a simple per-plane CNN that operates on the plane sweep volumes of the input images, removing the need for an initial MPI estimate. Here we show a rendering from the MPI at each iteration. As you can see, there's a significant improvement between the first and second iterations. However, further improvements are more subtle, showing the network makes large improvements at each step and converges quickly. In our paper, we showed that the gradients provided to the CNN have an intuitive interpretation in terms of visibility cues. Effectively, the first iteration solves for unoccluded surfaces, while later iterations use this visibility to find a better solution in occluded regions. Next, we'll show some results. Our method correctly reconstructs complex geometries such as the trees and the thin structures seen in this scene as well as the semi-transparent surfaces seen here and the reflections seen here. Here we false color the MPI planes, creating a pseudo depth map. Note in this scene how the, the reflection on the table is placed on a far MPI plane. Thank you for listening and please stop by our poster to learn more about our paper and the new spaces data set that we're releasing. All the speakers return to the stage for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, we have microphones um, in the front over here as well as over there. Go ahead. Um, for the deep view paper, can you comment about the training data you have? What um... uh, that is 100 scenes, and each scene is captured with a 16 camera array. And for each scene, we kind of uh, jitter the camera array, so we capture like uh, about about 10 viewpoints. So it's 100 scenes with about 10 viewpoints each, and each viewpoint has 16 cameras. But so in our results, we show, we show results with just four input views. Uh, the results I showed at the end had 16, all 16, but we can scale up and down. So your training is fully supervised, in a sense. Yeah, you can argue whether it's unsupervised, too, but yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? OK, I have one question for the first talk on uh, the progressive pose attention. So here, when you're generating different images to do uh, the person re-ID, are there any restrictions on the type of data you need to have access to in the first place in order to avoid uh, divergence of the model? Uh, actually, no. Yeah. No? Yeah. There, there are no, <laughs> no restrictions. Of, of the, that kind, we just uh, um, we 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 just used uh, uh, the image of the same identity to generate another. Uh, just uh, whatever, whatever poses you you get back, 
yeah, you can generate all those things. All right, well, if there are no other questions, let's thank our speakers once more. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexander, and I will present our joint work on animating arbitrary object via deep motion transfer. This work is done in collaboration with Stefan Lantieri, Sergei Telikov, Olivia Ricci, and Nico Seve. On this slide, you can see several objects animated by our system. Uh, our, given only a single source image and a driving video, our method can animate different objects. Our method does not require any prior knowledge about the object. So uh, in our settings, we are given a single source image and a driving video. And uh, we extract the motion representation from the driving video and combine it with the source image to obtain a generated video. But the question is, what is the appropriate motion representation for the driving video and how we can extract it from it? So the previous method uh, usually relies on uh, pre-trained key point detectors. Uh, this pre-trained key point detectors is uh, available when there is uh, uh, large labeled data. For well-explored domains such as human bodies or faces, uh, there is exist such pre-trained key point detectors. But uh, what if your objects are different? What if you want to animate, such, for example, cartoon animals or robot arms or even human bodies or faces, uh, but you don't want to use any labeled data and you don't know uh, any, don't want to make any prior assumption about them? Uh, in this case, uh, in our setting, we decide to formulate our method as a uh, self-supervised method. So we extract motion representation in a self-supervised way. Our method only requires a data set of uh, objects uh, of uh, similar uh, object category. So uh, at the training time, our method extract the source and the driving video, uh, source and the driving frame from a single uh, video. And uh, it estimates key point displacement between a source and driving video. This uh, uh, key point displacement is learned in a special way such that uh, it only encodes relevant motion patterns. At the test time, we um, extract the key point displacement from uh, two frames of driving video and the uh, um, uh, appearance we extract from uh, uh, another source image. Then we combine the key point displacement with the source image to obtain the frame of the generated video. We uh, test our method on several data set. Facial data set, the robot arm data set, the data set of uh, moving uh, animals, and the data set of humans performing Tai Chi moves. So here you can see visualization of the uh, key point obtained by our method. Uh, as you can see, the key point is consistent across the time and uh, across different instances. For example, the blue key point on the face data set is always located on the nose. Here are some results on the face data set. So uh, on the left, you can see the driving video, and on the top row is the source images. The motion is uh, well transferred, and the identity of the person is uh, preserved, as you can see. So next, uh, we present the results on a robot data set. In this uh, robot data set is a typical example where the key point detector is not available. But still, we can uh, generate a plausible video so we, in which the motion is uh, correctly transferred. And the even uh, shadows can be generated with our method. Uh, we also test uh, um, our method on a data set of uh, moving cartoon animals. This data set is challenging because every animal has a very different shapes and very different colors. But still, our method can generate uh, plausible animation of this, uh, of this object. Finally, we test our method on the uh, data set of uh, humans performing Tai Chi moves. This is uh, the most challenging data set because the human can move arbitrary in 3D and there are a lot of self-occlusion. But uh, we, uh, 
but we still are able to generate uh, realistic videos. And uh, the motion is modeled independently for each arm and uh, each leg in the video. We also apply our method on the higher resolution data set. Uh, if you want to know more implementation details, please wel you welcome at our poster number 124. Thank you for your attention. So, hello, my name is Alexandra Shoshe, and I would like to present our recent work on textured neural avatars. There has been a bunch of works that generate realistically looking humans using convolutional neural networks. Some well-known examples you can see on this slide. They generate very realistic images of human heads. Such results are hard to achieve using standard computer graphics representation without a special capture setups. Several very recent works create neural full body avatars. They use convolutional networks conditioned on some representation of the pose to obtain final renderings. These methods use neural image to image translation to convert sequence to realistic images. These systems work well when they synthesize images from the same camera viewpoint. Unfortunately, they don't work as well when we want to render an image of a person from a different viewpoint. Here, we show a result for a viewpoint unsealed during training. As you can see, in the method of Wang et al., there are some noticeable artifacts. So, to model a person's appearance, one may use either the classical computer graphics pipeline that separates the texture and 3D geometry, or a neural avatar. Our methods take the middle path between the two approaches. It uses convolutional network to model the body geometry, while the texture of the body is sto stored separately in a texture map, like in the standard computer graphics approach. Let us look how our method works in detail. Our system is trained from a bunch of video frames annotated with background segmentation and pose. The model has two major components, the neural network and the explicit texture stack comprising textures of individual body parts. The neural network and the texture stack are learned simultaneously during training. For each pixel, the neural network outputs probabilities of belonging to a particular body part as well as texture coordinates for each body part. In this case, the person's back. Then, for each body part, the texture is sampled in accordance <coughs> with the predicted texture coordinates. We sum up the sampled color values using part probabilities as weights. Note that all these operations are differentiable. So we get the rendered image that you will see in a second. We compare the rendered result with the ground truth image using perceptual loss. The predicted background mask is also compared to the ground truth. The image and the mask losses are back propagated into the neural network and onto the textures. We initialize the network to predict the result of the dense pose system given the full body stigment. Then, we initialize the texture by averaging it over multiple views. As you can see, after the initialization, the network predicts rather coarse body parts, uh, <coughs> maps, and the textures are very blurry. Then, after convergence, textures become crisper and the body part predictions improve. Here we show the result for a model trained from six videos. The model is applied to a novel pose and viewpoint, both unseen during training. As you can see, the renderings are reasonably realistic. Here uh, we also show the result for a fixed pose and multiple viewpoints. We provide a comparison to the video-to-video -video system conditioned on the same input. Here you see the result of our model trained on a single short video. The person is shown from new viewpoints. 
We also compare our result to an explicit 3D model obtained by the method of Aldeek et al. Finally, we applied our model to a YouTube video, and you can see the results on this slide. So thank you for your attention, and I hope to see you at our poster. Hi, this talk focuses on a problem that has remained unsolved until now, real-time video frame interpolation at high resolution. The goal of VFI is to synthesize new in-between frames in a video while maintaining smooth motion. When you simply replicate frames, you end up with a jittery video like the one shown here. Using our method, interpolated motion net, you can get a visually pleasing video. Why should you care about VFI? Well, it is used all around you, in TV displays for generating slow motion effects and in video conference calls. Unlike popular computer vision problems, VFI can be learned without any labeling at all. When partitioning a video into frame triplets, the middle frame can serve as ground tools for VFI. Now let, let's review some important lessons learned from applying deep learning to VFI. To avoid blurry outputs, it is better to design structured DNNs instead of trying to directly synthesize the output pixel values. The most common structure is designing the DNN as a motion compensation system where optical flow is only one component learned as part of the entire system. In motion compensation systems, you have two, two ingredients, an interpolated motion vector field, which tells you from where to take the pixel values, and an occlusion map, which tells you how to blend those pixel values together. Once you have these two ingredients, you can warp the input frames together, blend the warped frames, and synthesize the middle frame. Now let's review the current status of state-of-the-art methods. So these methods achieve outstanding results on low-resolution benchmarks, such as Middlebury, UCF 101, and Vimeo 90K. We also saw some amazing slow-motion effects in less CVPR in a work by NVIDIA. So you can ask, are there any remaining gaps? So to better answer this question, we mentioned three requirements which are essential for real-life use. Generalization to high resolution, handling well strong motion and real-time performance. The next couple of slides, we will look at two representative SOTA methods and check whether they satisfy these requirements. So for low resolution examples, such as the one shown here from, taken from the test set of Vimeo 90K, you can see really good performance of SOTA methods and IMNET, our method, achieves similar quality. But when looking at the same frames, but at high resolution, you see severe degradation in SOTA methods, while IMNET keeps the same quality. Not only do we outperform SOTA methods on high resolution frames, we also do it 16 times faster, and this is due to the lightweight architecture of IMNET, and for edgy resolution, we achieve real-time performance. Here are some other examples of high resolution frames with strong motion. You can see those hello and ghost, ghost artifacts for SOTA methods, but IMNET reduces these artifacts. Now for more details on the method, IMNET receives a pair of input frames at three different resolutions. Features are extracted from each image. Pairs of features are processed by encoder-decoder models. The decoder outputs are then merged and sent to three parallel estimation passes, which obtain blockwise estimates for the IMVF and the occlusion map. During inference, we use a very simple FI model, which consists of a deblocking mechanism to synthesize the middle frame. During training, we make use of two interpolation methods. For the full resolution frames, we make use of a, a twin linear frame interpolation. And for low resolution versions of these frames, we make use of SEPCOM sep separable convolution. To, better, to encourage the extracted features to be better aligned with each other, we also include warping terms. And we also added regularization terms and symmetry terms to better stabilize the, the training procedure. So during training, we make use of two interpolation methods, and actually each of them makes a different, inter uh, inter different interpretation to the output of the software class in the motion estimation passes. SEPCOM treats them as one denormalized filters operating on low resolution frames, and the second treats them as a, a pair of 1D motion class probabilities where the motion classes cover a wide range of motion. 
after applying center of mass computation, you can get the values of the IMBF. Now some uh, results on challenging videos. On the left, you can see IMNet. On the right, a SOTA method. And you can see the much less artifacts on the left, on the moving ball, legs, and background. And now for another challenging example. On the left, IMNet. On the right, a SOTA method. You can see much less goals and hellos for IMNet. So thank you so much for your attention. And we'll be happy to see you at our poster. All right, please step up if you have any questions for the speakers. OK, I'll start out. Um, for the textured neural avatars, you mentioned a perceptual loss. Could you elaborate on what you meant by that? And did you try alternative losses as well? There was a, a, a simple VGG loss. We, we used pre-trained network that is included in PyTorch, actually, and it works quite well. OK, that's yeah. good. All right. Thank you. All right, do you have any questions? No? OK, well, thank you again, speakers. So good afternoon. My name is Ying Chong Chen. And I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Today I will present our paper, Homomorphic Latency Based Interpolation for Unpaired Image to Image Translation. This work is also collaborated with the Tencent YouTube 2 lab. So, for unpaired image to image translation, most existing methods rely on cycle consistency to model the relationship between two domains. It can change certain attributes like closed mouth of the image without modifying its content. However, cycle consistency does not model intermediate regions between two domains. Therefore, this constraint alone does not support continuous translation. So on the other hand, latent-based interpolation focus on generating intermediate results between two samples. And given two samples of different domains, we can continuously generate the intermediate results in between. So the target attribute will be changed continuously. But this method cannot directly serve for image translation because image content, like the identity, will also change. So can latent spatial interpolation serve for image to image translation? Our answer is yes. And our intuition is that in a flat and smooth latent space, there exist many paths that connect between two samples. And different paths could generate different intermediate results. And our key idea is to choose the path that cause change only on the target attribute. For example, if our objective is to make this non-smiling person smile, then we can choose a path that change the expression first and then change other attributes later. Because the first part of the path only changed the expressions, the image content is preserved. Also, the interpolation-based framework naturally allows for continuous translation. Also, know that using another reference person leads to another type of smiling. So this suggests that our framework can deal with multimodal translation. Furthermore, recall that there is ma many paths between two samples. If we choose another path, we can change another attribute, like the gender. By using different paths, our framework can handle multi-domain translation. So how do we achieve this? Our model contains an encoder, an interpreter, and a decoder. Given a target image and a reference one, the encoder maps them to interpretable latent space. Then the interpreter interprets these two features. And the interpretation path is controlled by a control vector. Finally, the decoder inverts the interpreted feature back to the image space. So the control vector here determines which attribute to change. For example, 
By using another control vector, we can change the expression instead of the gender. We can also control the added strength by changing the scale of the control vector, like this. So what can this model do? Well, firstly, it can manipulate facial attributes like other image-to-image -image translation models. So given the original images, by choosing different interpretation paths and different reference image, we can change their expressions, bands, gender, matas, hair color, edge, and so on. And furthermore, by changing, by continuously changing the expressions, we can handle a task like converting a still photo to a live photo. So to summarize, this paper presents an alternative framework for unpaired image-to-image -image translation. This allows for multi-model, multi-domain, and continuous translation simultaneously. Thank you very much for your attention. For more details, please visit our poster. Our poster number is 127. Uh, hello, everyone. Since the visa issue, the first author can't be here, I will present for him. So we present multi-channel attention slash again with cascade semantic guidance for cross-view image generation. And this work was jointly done with Tang Hao, Xu Dan, Nico Sebi, Yan Zhi Wang, and Jason Koso. So the goal of the cross-view image generation aims at synthesizing new image from one viewpoint to another. However, we observe unsatisfactory results in existing methods mainly in the generated scene structure and details, which are due to three reasons. The first one is the label maps are usually produced from pre-trained semantic model from the other large-scale segmentation data set, leading to insufficient accurate prediction for all the pixels, and thus misleading the image generation. The second one is the gen translation with a single-phase generation network is not able to capture the complex scene structure relationship between the two views. And the last one is the three channel generation space may not be suitable enough for learning a good mapping for this complex synthesis problem. So to this end, we propose a novel selection GAN to get its image of nature science in arbitrary viewpoints based on an image of the scene and novel semantic map. In this way, the conditional image can provide appearance information and the semantic map can provide the structural information. So let's see more details about our method. So selection again consists of two stages. The stage one presents a cycled semantic guided generation subnetwork which accepts image from one view and conditional semantic maps and simultaneously generate images and semantic maps in another view. The stage two takes the cost prediction and the learn deep semantic features from stage one and perform a fine green generation using the proposed multi-channel attention selection modular. So let's look at the proposed multi-channel attention selection modular, so which consists of multi-skier special polling and the multi-channel attention selection component. So the multi-skier special polling post feature in different receptive fields in order to have better generation of the same details. And the multi-channel attention selection aim as automatically select from a set of intermediate diverse generation in a larger generation space to improve the generation quality. So we first conduct application studies and propose selection again has eight baselines. We observe that the performance of each baseline is better than the previous one. So we compare the proposed method with three state-of-the-art method on the area to ground image translation task. So we input a real image and want to generate the corresponding ground image. So these are results generated by pixel-to-pixel, x-fork, and the sequence, and hours. 
So our selection gain generates much visually better results and baselines. For ground to area image translation, we input the ground image and want to generate the corresponding area images. So these are the results generated by pixel to pixel and x folk and x sequence and hours. So for more experiment results, please revive, revive our paper. So we further use the eagle to top dataset to conduct arbitrary cross view image generation experiments. So given a single input image and some novel semantic maps, selection GAN is able to generate the same thing, but with different viewpoints. So, so here is another example. So in summary, we propose a novel multi-channel attention selection GAN framework for the cross-view image translation task. So we present a novel multi-channel attention selection modular which is utilized to attentively select interest intermediate generations and is able to significantly boost the quality of the final output. So the experiment experiments clearly demonstrate the effectiveness of our proposed selection again and show state of our result on three public data sets. So we released the project page and the PyTorch code online. So feel free to use it. If you're interested, please come to our poster. So thanks for your attention. Uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ming Ming Gong. So because of visa issue, uh, the Huang Fu cannot come, so I'm going to present our work on geometry consistent GAN for unsupervised domain mapping. This is a joint work with uh, Huang Fu, Chao Hui Wang, Ken Han, Ben McGlish, Kun Zhang, and Da Chen Tao. So unsupervised domain adaptation is also known as unpaired image translation in vision. So in this problem, we are given two domains of unpaired images, and our goal is to find the mapping to map one domain to the other. So since we are basically trying to estimate the conditional distribution from two marginal distributions, so this is a year process problem. Even given infinite sample size, it's, there's no theoretical guarantee that we can find the true function. So, uh, okay. so ex existing method to this problem try to add uh, some constraint to the solution space to restrict the solutions. So for example, the pioneering work uh, Sakugan enforces that the translated image can be reconstructed back to the original input image. And this can be done in the re reverse direction. So that's, this forms Sakura con consistency. And the recent work, uh, distance scan, is enforces the dist pairwise distance between the input images to be preserved after translation such that the geometric structures of the images can be better preserved. So here's the motivation of our work. So in, instead of working on a given image data set, we first uh, ap apply a predefined geometric transformation to the original data set to construct a new data set. Then we can train two GANs independently on these two data sets. If the uh, learning function is close to the true function, we, can, we may expect the outputs to have the same relation between the images. So for example, here is the, is the rotation. Unfortunately, we can see from the results, they are not consistent with, with each other in many regions of the image. So in some regions, there should be a restricted uh, ex exact rotation, but it's not satisfied. So based on this observation, we propose to train these two networks on the original data set and the uh, transform, transform the data sets together. And first, we enforce these two networks to share the parameters in all the convolutional layers. And also, we add the geometric consistency constraint, which enforces the outputs of these two networks, which is on the original and the transform data sets, to be consistent. So for example, if the original image have a rotation relationship, relationship between them, the outputs should also satisfy this constraint. As we can see, by adding this constraint, uh, we can better preserve the geometric structure. So in the following, I'm going to show some qualitative results. We first apply our method to the cityscape data set, where we try to learn the segmentation mask in an unsupervised, unsupervised way. So our method can give very good results. And also, we can 
uh, generate images from these seg segmentation masks. We also apply a method to the photo to map application in which we want to uh, translate the satellite images to the maps. We can see by adding the geometric consistency loss, our method can better preserve the geometric structures in the map. So here is the SV, uh, HN to MNIST translation. So here, our method can better can translate image, uh, images to the ditches, which can be better classified by the pre-trained classifier, meaning that the distortion is minimal in our method. We also apply it to the host to zebra application, where our method can successfully transfer host to zebra without changing the background. So here is another application we uh, transfer from money to photo. We can see that our method can generate very realistic images, the like photos. And this is another application from synthetic to real uh, images. Our method can still perform well on this uh, data set. So finally we, uh, finally we apply our method to the photo to artist painting. So the results are also uh, very reasonable. But there, nevertheless, there are some failure cases in our method where, okay, <laughs> okay, thank you. So if you are, thank you for your attention. If you are interested, please go to uh, our poster 129. Thank you. Let's have all the speakers come back up. Oh, here, for questions. All right, once again, if you have any questions, please come up to the microphones. In the meantime, um, I have a question for the homomorphic latent space interpolation. So my question is about the interpolator. How did you design that, uh, that model and how sensitive was it to that design? Uh, the interpolator is, uh, is a multi-branch one and each branch corresponds to one attribute. And for each branch, it is just a, a three-layer convolution uh, network. Yeah. So it is trained to be, uh, the interpolator is trained to perform interpolation that is homomorphic. That is the change in the, in the latent feature uh, change similarly to the change of the attribute. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say on that last paper, geometry consistent generative. Um, doesn't the improvement in performance suggest partially that the problem could be that you have an incomplete training set? Uh, excuse me. If you had, a, if okay, let's just say you took your training set and you you magnified it by several orders of magnitude. Yeah. Do you still expect to see an improvement? Uh, we tried uh, to improve like. Uh, Construct three data sets. Well, uh, say so anytime you do, because um, if I remember, you rotated the images. Yeah, yeah. All you did was you just doubled your data set, right? Yes. Because yes. now you added to rotate it. So couldn't you have just had a much bigger data set? Wouldn't the improvement have gotten, you know, arbitrarily small? Uh, this we haven't tried. We, we just uh, do these experiments on the standard data sets. Okay, so yeah. you still have some. Okay, we'll talk yeah. later about yeah. the posters. Thank okay. you, though. Thank yeah. you. We have time for one quick last question. Uh, my question is also for the GCGAN. Uh, do you have ideas about how to extend that work for 3D geometry? For geometry GAN, yeah. Uh, excuse me, could you repeat that question? Yeah, do you have ideas about how to extend that for 3D geometry? 3D geometry? Yeah. Oh, this I haven't considered, sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speakers once more. Hi, my name is Vincent and I'm gonna talk about deep voxels or how we learn a 3D structure where scene representation just from images for high quality novel view synthesis. We assume that we are given a training set of images and their camera poses for a single scene such as this vase and at training time we're going to globally optimize over all these 2D observations to obtain the 3D structure where representation. At test time, this will enable us to render novel views of that scene without access to the original training data. 
deboxes outperforms other approaches without a explicit 3D structure aware representation by a wide margin, such as this pix to pix variant. And I'm going to talk about two of our core contributions. The first one is the framework to arrive at the deboxes representation, and I'm going to illustrate that in two dimensions. So let's say we're given a training set of pictures and poses of this Greek pedestal, and we want to find the deboxes representation. Deboxes begins as an empty voxel grid of features, and now we want to integrate all these 2D observations into this 3D voxel grid. The first step is to pick a random image from our training set and extract 2D features with a 2D confnet. Now, because we have the extrinsic and intrinsic camera parameters for this pose, we can lift these 2D features into 3D by shooting a ray through each of the features and copying them into a temporary voxel grid wherever the ray intersects the voxel. Now, this is a new 3D observation that we want to integrate into our voxel grid, and we do that with a 3D convolutional neural network that updates the deboxes representation. To supervise these steps, we go the other way around. We pick another view from the training set, and we're going to project the features from the voxel grid onto the image plane of that view, and that yields a 2D feature map. And now we can use a 2D rendering network, just a normal confnet, to render the observation from that perspective. And because we have the ground truth for that perspective, we can now enforce a 2D re-rendering loss on that image. We can now backpropagate this loss all the way back to the feature extraction network, um, and supervise the whole pipeline just with images. And we just iterate over the training set until both the voxel grid and the weights of the neural networks have converged. Finally, at test time, we can just throw away the training images and render novel views of the same object just with the voxel grid and the rendering network. So, so far we've kind of glanced over the fact that the projection operator needs to reason about occlusions because it needs to know which voxel to pick along each ray. Um, our second core contribution is thus an occlusion network that does exactly that. So let's say we want to render this voxel grid, and the gray silhouette in the background, that's the ground truth geometry of the scene, which we do not know. And the, the bold ray intersects this geometry in the first yellow voxel, so that's the one we want to pick and we want to project. So the first step is to resample the deep voxels into the canonical view volume where all camera rays are parallel. We now feed this view volume to an occlusion network, which sees all the voxels along a single ray, and predicts the visibility score for each of the voxels, and those are softmax scores. So voxels that are occluded or free space should get low scores, and the, the yellow voxel in this case should get a high score. And now you just do a weighted sum along the ray, and that's the voxel you're going to project for that, um, for that view. So now we can also use these visibility scores to compute a depth map, completely unsupervised, and that's gonna show us how the voxels reasons about geometry in the scene it reconstructs. So on the left, you can see a reconstruction without the occlusion network, on the right with the occlusion network, and in the center, the unsupervised depth map. And except, uh, in, um, and not only does the occlusion network improve performance, but also we can see that the voxels correctly reasons about the geometry of the scene. So let's look at a few baseline comparisons. So on the top left corner, you can see the ground truth null views of the Greek pedestal. On the bottom left, you can see a nearest neighbor in the training set. And on the right, we compare three baselines that don't have a 3D structure aware representation and deep voxels. And you can see that um, in contrast to the baselines, deep voxel succeeds at rendering multi-view consistent null views of these objects. Deboxes also works on real scenes. Uh, we capture around 400 images with a DSLR camera and run deboxes on these images. And on the left-hand side, you can see the output of deboxels. On the right-hand side, the closest image in the training set. And you can see that deboxels even manages to um, generate light specularities, as in the globe on the top right corner. Um, so that's deboxels. Um, the data set and the code uh, are both online. You can find them on my website. Um, and there's also a follow-up project that I'm very excited about where we generalize across scenes and there's no voxel grids anymore. So check that out. And I'd like to thank my amazing collaborators and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dejan, and it is a pleasure to be here today and to present my work, Inverse Path Tracing for Joint Material and uh, Lighting Estimation. Given the geometry of an indoor scene, along with a set of uh, input views and their corresponding camera positions, 
uh, we would like to solve the inverse rendering problem for this scene. Uh, that means uh, for every object in the scene, we want to estimate intrinsic parameters such as the albedo, the emission, or the roughness. Knowing these parameters would uh, allow us to uh, would allow us uh, various applications. For example, we could uh, render the scene from novel views. We propose a, a physically based approach where we first render the scene and uh, uh, obtain gradients uh, by differentiable path tracing to update the material and emission parameters of every object uh, in the scene. Starting from an initial guess of the parameters, we use stochastic gradient descent to iteratively update the parameters until our rendering matches the image that was given as input. We formulate an optimization problem with respect to unknown uh, parameters theta consisting of material parameters M and lighting parameters L. We use the Disney BRDF model for our materials and extended the original implementation to uh, compute derivatives with respect to the BRDF parameters. For the lighting, uh, we represent it uh, uh, with an RGB value for every object in the scene. Our goal is to minimize the L1 difference uh, between uh, the captured pixel intensities, IC, and the reconstructed pixel intensities, IR. Here, NP represents the total number of pixels across all images that take part in the optimization process. Since it's difficult to uh, distinguish between emitted light and reflected light, uh, we assume that most objects in the scene are not emitters and also add an L1 regularizer to our NO objects uh, in the scene. Uh, to solve the optimization problem, uh, we use Adam and uh, provide uh, our analytically uh, derived gradients. Here we evaluate our method on a synthetic scene, and in the lower right corner of the videos also show uh, the albedo colors of the objects. The materials were reconstructed from only six views. Here we show a ground truth rendering of a synthetic scene, followed by an estimate from a method that is based on spatially varying spherical harmonics, and finally by the estimates from our method. As is visible in the error map, the baseline is missing shadows and the near field illumination effects, whereas uh, our method is uh, able to correctly reconstruct these effects. We further evaluate our method on the real world scenes from the Matterport uh, 3D dataset. On the left, we show input photographs. In the middle, our renderings with the estimated material and lighting parameters, and on the right, uh, our estimated albedos. One application of our method is uh, augmented reality, where we wish to insert new objects into existing scenes. Basic image compositing approaches uh, uh, have uh, incorrect shading and also do not take into account uh, shadows that are cast uh, from the newly inserted objects. Uh, we, uh, we take advantage of the estimated material and lighting parameters to correctly re-render the composited scene. This is a photograph of a scene from Metaport 3D. Uh, here we uh, show that uh, knowledge of the material and lighting in the scene uh, enables us uh, to correctly reshade the input photograph after adding the teddy bear. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, at poster 131. Hi everyone, I am Jean-Baptiste, and today I'm going to talk about the visual centrifuge, a model-free layered video representation. Our visual world is complex. Many everyday scenes contain reflections, shadows, transparencies. For instance, take this scene of someone driving its car in the countryside. How do we make sense of such data? 
First, we can use motion, where we can use the fact that the face in the background is mostly static, whereas the trees being reflected are in movement. Second, we have semantic use, where we can easily discriminate pixels belonging to a person from pixels belonging to the trees. The purpose of this work is to design models with such visual abilities in order for them to be robust to this kind of realistic phenomena. A natural framework for handling these factors is to model them as layers that compose into an overall video. This framework encompasses various natural phenomena like reflections, occlusions, or shadows. In all cases, multiple layers get assembled together into a final image. So our goal in this work is to train a model able to decompose a video into its composing layers in the spirit of a visual centrifuge. Of course, we are not the first to be interested in such model, and layer representation for images dates back as far as 1994. Our main difference with such work is that we focus on videos, and we opt for a learning-based approach, hoping that it can alleviate the burden of making strong assumptions about the data. Here is our approach. We have a simple encoder-decoder type of model, able to take a video as input and decompose it into several layers, as shown in this example. For that, we use a basic encoder-decoder architecture where the encoder is an I3D network and the decoder is composed of up3D convolutions to be able to upsample features. Finally, the encoder and decoder are linked with skip connections in a unit fashion. This produces two independent outputs illustrated here on the right. We also investigate improvements over this simple architecture for which you can find details in the paper. But how do we train such a model? We need both data and the training signal. I will present these two components next. So for the data, we use a simple data generation scheme where we simply take two videos and average them in pixel space. You can see here an example of such a process. The nice thing is that we can generate lots and lots of data like this for which we have access to the ground truth, meaning we know what are the composing layers. To give you an order of magnitude, there are roughly 500,000 clips in kinetics which means that there are around 100 billion possible pairs, which basically says that we are in an infinite training data regime. And how do we train such a network? One challenge that we face is referred as the permutation label problem in the literature. Indeed, there are no simple ways to tell the network where to output the first or the second video. Both options are completely fine. To address this challenge, we use a standard permutation invariant loss, which simply equals the minimum reconstruction loss over all possible matchings between ground truth and outputs. For the reconstruction loss between the two videos U and V, we use the L1 loss on the images and on their gradients to put more emphasis on edges. Let's now look at some results on the held out validation dataset. The video I will play will be as follow. On the left, I show the two original videos, in the middle, the mixed video that is input to our model, and on the right, the outputs of the model. As you can see, the model is able to do a reasonable job at that task. And this is also true when we mix videos of the same class or when videos share same color, as, as in this challenging example. Now, will this synthetically trained model work on real-world videos? So we try this on the car video I showed earlier. And our trained visual centrifuge is able to disentangle reasonably well the person driving the car and the trees that are getting reflected in the windscreen. And interestingly, even though the data generation process was mostly matching the reflection model, we see that our model is able to do other type of layer decomposition, such as shadow removal here. Or even light projection removal on the face of this girl. So of course, the model is still not perfect and still makes some mistakes, some of which are interesting, if not disturbing. In summary, we presented a model able to mix blended videos. In the paper, we showed that the model leverages both semantic and motion cues, and that it can be applied to real-world videos. Come to our poster for more details. Thank you. All right, please step up if you have any questions for the speakers. Vladlin, you're looking for a microphone? OK. Go ahead. And um. While you're approaching the mic, can I have a question for the deep voxels work? Sure. Um, one of the fundamental um, 
uh, assumptions you made is that you know the camera pose mm -hmm. during the training. Mm -hmm. Can you bootstrap that? Can you do your method without camera pose? Um, I think that's a, that's a great point, and I think uh, there is actually work that has attempted this recently from CMU, so yeah, I think you, you could totally think about that, and I think that would be a very interesting approach. Thank you. I have a question to the last speaker. So do you have any intuition how does your network decide which video to send to the first branch and which video to send to the, to the second branch? Yeah. So we tried to see if there was some correlation with simple stuff like illumination or things like this, but we didn't have a, a good, like we never find what was the right, what, what was the decision process for doing that. But it's something we are interested in. So if you have some intuitions, that'd be, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Question to the second speaker. I'm familiar with the ICL and UIM data set that you showed. And the data set is actually much, much more realistic than what you showed on your slides. The materials are much more realistic. The rendering is much more realistic. So it seems that you actually stripped out the original materials and rendering and replaced them with something simplified. Why did you have to do that? Uh, we started with some uh, uh, simple materials. Uh, first, we had uh, one color, color per object. Uh, then uh, we added also uh, textured materials uh, and uh, materials with uh, specularities. Uh, and uh, in our next uh, project, uh, we also want uh, more uh, complicated materials uh, with uh, reflections and uh, maybe transparency. Okay, for transparency, it might be appropriate to explicitly acknowledge that this is not the original data set. Okay, thank you. I have a question to the third speaker. Uh, in training time, you have two input and one uh, in the, the model tries to decompose the input video into two, which are the same uh, one into one and two into two. And in, in test time, the, the input is not seen in the training time. So I think the model is uh, struggling to uh, where the where the, each component goes to first or second, and it might be ambiguous. And do you have some, uh, do you see some tendency, like uh, some, some uh, these videos decomposing into one and two, and the other videos decomposing into two and one, such kind of things? So I think it's related to the first question we had. And yeah, so for the moment at this time, what we do to select, uh, you, we need to have a manual, uh, decision to decide like where is the background, where is the reflection layer, but this kind of thing like to understand more how the network decide where to put each of each video is something we are working on and yeah, but we don't have a good um, Thank you. yet. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry to cut off questions and thank you for giving us a little more time, but we should stay on schedule and, and let's thank our speakers again. Oh no, not your fault. That was great. Hi, everyone. My name is Takuhiro Kaneko from the University of Tokyo, Japan. In this talk, I'm going to introduce our work, Label Noise Robust Generative Adversal Networks. This is joint work with Yoshitaka Ushiku and Tatsuya Harada. In this work, our goal is to construct a label noise robust conditional image generator that can reproduce green label data even when noisy label data are only available during the training. This problem is challenging for naive conditional generic models such as SEGAN and CGAN because they attempt to construct a generator condition on observable labels, namely noisy labels in this case. Indeed, as shown here, when naive CGAN is trained with noisy label data, its performance is significantly de degraded, influenced by noisy labels. To overcome this limitation, we propose label noise robust GANs, or RGANs. As shown here, differently from the naive C GAN, our RC GAN can generate images condition clean labels, even when trained with noisy label data. This is the main contribution of this work. The main idea for solving this problem is to incorporate a noise transition model 
which represent a transition probability from the clean label to the noisy label. In particular, we propose two variants, RAC-GAN and RC-GAN for the two basic conditional extensions of GANs, AC-GAN and C-GAN respectively. The first baseline is AC-GAN, which runs a conditional gener generator with a discriminator and an auxiliary classifier. AC-GAN works well when given clean label data, but a limitation is that the auxiliary classifier can fit noisy level when trained with noisy level data. To overcome this limitation, we propose RIC GAN, in which we incorporate a noisy transition model into the auxiliary classifier to correct its prediction. This modification allows us to obtain the clean level classifier. In RIC GAN, the generator is optimized using this corrected classifier. The other baseline is C-GAN, which runs a conditional generator with a conditional discriminator. C-GAN also works well when given clean level data, but our limitation is that the generator is optimized conditional noisy level when trained with noisy level data. To overcome this limitation, we propose our C-GAN, in which we incorporate a noise transition model into the discriminator to correct its input. By this modification, we can optimize the generator condition cooling levels. To the best of our knowledge, the label noise eff effect on conditional image generator has not been examined sufficiently. To advance this research, we conducted a comprehensive study for 336 conditions described here. We first showed the comparison between the proposed model and the baselines across all the conditions. In both figures, those above the diagonal line indicate that the proposed model is better than the baseline. This result confirms that proposed models outperform the baselines in most cases. These are generated image samples on CIFR-10 in symmetric noise, in which labels are corrupt uniformly. We find that CSN GAN, which is a state of the earth, is significantly degraded in this case. As another example, we show generated image samples on C14 in asymmetric noise, in which labels are flipped between specific classes. We find that in this case, the baseline models confuse between the flipped classes, such as cat and dog. As further analysis, we conducted three experiments. First, as a more practical setting, we examined the effects when the noise transition model is estimated from data. Next, we validate the effect of an improved technique, which we developed to boost the performance in severely noisy setting. Finally, we tested on closing 1M, which includes real-world noisy label data to analyze the effectiveness in real-world noise. Please check our paper for their details. Thank you for listening. Our code is public available here. If you are interested in our work, please come to our poster session. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Regong from ETH. Uh, today I'm going to present our work. The uh, domain flow for adaptation and generalization. This is a joint work with Wen, Yuha, and Luke. The domain adaptation techniques aim to reduce the domain gap between the source domain and the target domain. It has different applications, such as the image translation and the synthetic to real semantic segmentation. And taking the image translation, for example, the traditional image translation techniques aim to translate the images between two disjoint domains directly. However, it is highly challenged if the domain gap between the two domains is large. In contrast to the previous works, our flow model aims to bridge the source domain and the target domain by a continuous sequence of intermediate domains. Actually, the intermediate domains on feature level have been discussed in some previous works to ease the domain adaptation task. However, the limitation is that the intermediate domains on feature level are not applicable for deep models directly. As a, as a comparison, our flow model can generate the pixel level intermediate domains. 
which are applicable for deep models and can be extended to the style translation and generalization. Next, I'm going to talk about how we can generate the intermediate domain. For an intermediate domain, MZ, we assume it can be represented by a variable from zero to one. We name it dominus. Two special cases of the dominus variable, zero and one, represent the source domain and the target domain, respectively. We also assume the distance measurement. The distance to the source domain and the target domain should have a ratio of xi to y minus xi. And the intermediate domain should be on the shortest path connecting the source domain and the target domain. Given the source domain and the dominicity, the intermediate domain can be generated by a generator, and the generator can be optimized by rewriting the distance with the dominus. So how can we measure the distance? Let's first take a look at Sekogan. In Sekogan, the discriminator measures the uh, jensen shannon distance between the translated image domain and the target image domain. In our work, we also use the jensen shannon distance as our distance measurement. The intermediate domain image is produced from the source image and the domain is there. Since we need to measure the jensen shannon distance between the intermediate domain and the other two domains, two discriminators are used. Recall the optimization objective of our uh, of the app generator. We can get the loss function for our low model. During the inference stage, we can generate a continuous sequence of images in the intermediate domains by varying dominance variable d from zero to one. We demonstrate the effectiveness of our model into scenarios. The first one is the synthetic two-real semantic segmentation. In this experiment, we use our DLOW model to translate the GTA 5 image to the, uh, to the cityscapes image. From the viral results, it is shown that our model can translate the source image into the intermediate domain and the target domain smoothly by varying domain variable. And the semantic segmentation performance proved that our, the uh, intermediate domains can ease the domain adaptation task the, uh, the another scenario is the style generalization task. In this case, we use multiple target domains and replace the dominance variable with the dominance vector. From the visual results, it is shown that our model can translate the source image into different target styles and even the mixed styles smoothly. And the user preference results prove that the majority of users prefer our translation results compared with the two competing methods, FedNet and MuNet. As a take home message, our DLOW model can generate the pixel level intermediate domain, which can use the domain adaptation task and can be extended to the style generalization. We will have our code available at GitHub very soon. For more discussion, please come to our poster. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Dong Li, and I'm PhD candidate of KAIST. Let me introduce call again, which is collaborative GAN for missing image data imputation. Missing data is a widespread problem in research field which dealing with big data such as computer vision, medical data, etc. So our goal is to estimate these missing data using the other data from remaining domains. And the consequences of the missing data introduce the bias or error. So here the imputation means the replacement of these missing data. So there are many imputation algorithms for the numerical data. And here I'd like to extend the problem to missing image imputation. For example, in medical imaging, doctors need a multiple contrast images for cancer diagnosis. And what if there exists missing contrast? And for illumination images, what if you want to find some specific illumination using the other remaining illuminations? So we'd like to propose missing image imputation technique called collaborative generative neural network. So here is the background. Most of you are already familiar with 
familiar with GAN generator, discriminator, and adversarial training. And also, the cycle GAN is one of powerful image-to-image -image translation technique between two domains. And here, let's imagine that there are multiple domains, not just two. Um, so, there are multiple domains. So, uh, multiple domain means uh, there are many inputs. So, we need many inputs. So, <clears throat> and I'm uh, sorry. Okay. And uh, to expansion to the multiple domain needs uh, should consider the multiple inputs. So. Uh, as you can see in this table, CycleGAN has a problem on the scalability, and the StarGAN was proposed to deal with multiple domain with using single generator and single discriminator. And however, StarGAN cannot handle the multiple inputs. So uh, our goal is to deal with a multiple domain and the multiple inputs at a time, so we proposed call again. As you can see in this figure, the, all of the inputs from the multiple domain can utilize and also, if there are additional domains are missing, Collagen works on various number of inputs. So here I'll, I will explain the detailed uh, characteristic of the Collagen. It utilizes the multiple inputs, and the mask vector indicates the target domain for the single generator. And we utilize the least scale GAN for adversarial model and there exists the domain classification branch for the single discriminator. And here, the original cycle consistency cannot be defined on the multiple input, so we redefined it. Um, the combinations of multiple inputs and the fakes can generate the reconstruction image and for the multiple domain. And the measure of similarity between the reconstruction and the input image for multiple domain is called a multiple cycle consistency loss. So we evaluate the performance of collagen for following three data sets. First, MR contrast images, and second, illumination images, and the third, the facial expression images. In the MR contrast imputation, the proposed method shows our performs other deep learning method with very accurate reconstruction performance. And for the second, illumination, collagen reconstructs not only the overall illumination, but also the details of the illumination from the nose genes, and chicks, etc. And for the facial expression, collagen reconstructs more natural and expressive facial expressions compared to the others. And here, since there exists a multiple redundancy of multiple inputs, some of inputs may not contribute. So to achieve the true collaborative learning, we applied random nulling on the input images called input dropout. So without dropout, performance is degraded and we drop out, as you can see in this figure, the collagen shows robust performance on various missing numbers. So in short, so we proposed collagen for multi-domain missing image imputation, and with the help of multiple cycle consistency and the input dropout, the collagen performs well by synergistically combining the information. My postal is 135, thank you. We have time for some questions. Please come up to the microphones. Uh, to get started for the label noise, the first paper, uh, thank you for doing some ablation experiments with different types of noise, but I'm, I'm curious if you experimented at all with um, it biased sort of label space or biased sort of noise. A uh, biased label space, so meaning uh, kind of a lot of examples of certain labels or a certain bias in, t in the noise, not, not just a flipping between uh, uh, two labels. I use two types of labels. One is a symmetric noise, we cropped uh, uniformly. And the second one is a symmetric noise in which uh, we crop two classes. We flip between two classes. Okay, I have a question in that case um, for domain flow. So, uh, so you have a, a input Z, which controls how much of each domain you want. So if you're going photos to Van Gogh, let's say zero would be photos, one would be Van Gogh. Did you try extrapolation at any point, trying to go, you know, Van Gogh, but then some, or photos, but even more realistic? Uh, um, good in, question. Uh, you mean the other direction? Uh, uh, yeah, it could be the negative numbers or beyond one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, mm, yes, we try that, but. Uh, 
actually, in some uh, in some extent, for example, if uh, during the training we only use the the uh, normalized vector, and if you, uh, for example, you the um, actually now in our testing experiment we actually normalize everyone at the normalized vector, but if we try something, for example, uh, improve from the 1 to 1.5, actually it will import some noise, so we don't uh, explore on this track, mm -hmm. but um, maybe uh, during the training, if you don't normalize the vector, you uh, during the testing, you if you improve it, maybe it is effective, but we have not done some experiments on that. All right, yeah. thank you, great answer. No problem, thank you. Ah, great. Uh, so I have a question for domain flow paper. So uh, in your paper, you mentioned that there are multiple paths between source and uh, target domain, right? Uh, but you choose to, uh, so it's, it's question for the domain flow paper. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. So you choose to go with the shortest path. Uh, is there a reason for that? Because uh, is there a reason for like longer paths might not be intuitive or something, or why? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, it is our optimization objective because from the source domain to the target domain, you, you will have so many available paths. Yep. And uh, our prior knowledge is that the ratio uh, to the source domain and to the target domain, should, the, the distance should have the ratio of di to i minus di. And so the right. blue, blue, blue line, it all meets this requirement. And we want to find that when the blue, the, uh, I, I don't have the picture, but the blue line, the intersection of the blue line and the shortest space. So that's why we, uh, you, we optimize it. Yeah, that's we. That's why we use it for the optimization. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's thank our speakers once again. All right. This concludes this session. Thank you, everyone, for coming.